What's going on everyone? So welcome to part two of me ranking every single best picture winner. Um, obviously this is part two. Part one was, just as a reminder, was 93 to 76. Part two is going to be 75 to 51. Um, so all that exposition, actually a little bit more exposition for this review. Um, obviously if you're new to the channel and you haven't you know, seen the other videos, uh, keep in mind I'm not going to be talking in depth at all because I've already done this kind of ranking it's just this is kind of a free-for-all so if you wanted me to talk a little bit more about these movies you can check out my ranking for each movie per decade for the best picture winners down below but guys all that being said let's get started so kicking things off with number 75 is how green was my valley yeah uh, it's whatever can't believe it beat since the game um, so that's my number 75. Number 74 is The King's Speech, which I liked the first time I saw, but I gave it a second watch in preparation for reviewing the 2000s Best Picture winners. And uh, it, it definitely, upon rewatch, I'm like, this is pretty standard issue. It has a good message, but I'm not a big fan of this movie at all. I'm pretty indifferent to it at this point. But yeah, that's my number 74. Number 73 is Mrs. Miniver. Mrs. Miniver? Whatever. It's it's uh, it's a 40s Best Picture winner. 1940s was a pretty good time in terms of movies, but I'm surprised this won Best Picture. It's it's pretty conventional, uh, even for its time period, to be honest. Um, so that's my number 73. Number 72 is Hamlet, which this was a chore to get through. You know, this, this truly was a chore to get through. And I'll leave it at that. So that's my number 72. Next up, number 71 is Mutiny on the Bounty, which is, it's okay. It's, it's not terrible. It's just, it's okay. You know, it's a bit too long um, in plotting, but, you know, there are some pretty cool scenes, I will say. Um, I still haven't seen the remake, but, you know, as far as the original goes, it's okay. Next up, number 70 is Chicago, which I saw one and a half times. I saw a first time and I thought it was solid. Gave it a second watch and I wasn't even able to get through it. It wasn't necessarily that it was bad. It was just kind of like, eh, style over substance. And I just wasn't feeling the style at the time. Felt a bit too reminiscent of Moulin Rouge, but, eh. It's whatever. If someone likes this movie, which, trust me, on my 2000s Best Picture ranking list, I've noticed a lot of people like this movie. So, I can I can dig it. Uh, so, that's my number 70. Next up, number 69 is Ordinary People. This is, well, an ordinary movie. What can I say? Uh, next up, number 68 is Wings, which Wings I thought was okay. Um, I like the cinematography a lot with this movie. And as far as one of the Best Picture winners goes... It's intriguing to say the least. Uh, yeah, that's what I'll write. Number 68. Number 67 is All Quiet on the Waterfront. Um, oh, wait. All Quiet on the Western Front. My mistake. I was getting two Best Picture winners combined. All Quiet on the Western Front. Uh, this movie was okay. I definitely respect it, though, with what it had to do in terms of the genre. I mean, this was one of the first war films, for crying out loud. And um, it, it holds up pretty well, I, I'd say. Uh, next up, 66, is A Man for All Seasons, which, it's interesting. I mean, given the fact that it won Best Picture, despite not having any big names or really any marketing, kind of intriguing and honestly interesting, to say the least. Um, it is, again, a little too slow for myself, and I can't see myself revisiting this movie anytime soon. And yeah, that's why it's my number 66. Next up, 65, is Gentleman's Agreement, which... Truth be told, I mean, I'm pretty sure even for its time period, it was pretty, like, been there, done that. But the execution was fun, I will say. Uh, but, yeah, that's my number 65. Number 64 is The Artist, which I've seen twice. And I respect with the fact that it's a silent film in 2011. But besides that, um, it's really one of those films that I appreciate the craftsmanship more than I appreciate the rewatchability value and the entertainment value. Like, I enjoyed it in the moment when I watched it both times, but, you know, I haven't revisited it in nearly 10 years. And it's simply just because, again, I enjoyed it, but I just can't see myself rewatching it, you know, unfortunately. Next up, number 63 is You Can't Take It With You. Um, this was quite enjoyable, I will say. Um, I, you know, respect it, but it's not great. It, it's, it's, a, it's just okay. Uh, next up, number 62 is Gandhi. Um, this movie, I'm, I am kind of interested in rewatching because I just thought it was okay and a little too long, but I do remember liking Ben Kingsley's performance. And this is also Daniel Day Lewis's first performance, I believe in a very small role, but still, uh, but yeah, I, I do need to rewatch this movie. 
Um, so that's my number 62. Number 61 is Marty, which was a surprise success when it came out and apparently was a tax write-off. So the fact that a tax write-off movie ended up winning Best Picture, kind of intriguing. Uh, this movie, it's it's fun. You know, Ernest Borgnine does such a good job in the lead role. It's it's fun. It's clever. You know, it's something monumental, but it's fun. Next up, number 60 is Driving Miss Daisy, which I have it a little higher up on the list, not because it's like necessarily good, but because I remember when I watched it, I enjoyed it. I'm sure that if I rewatched it, it would go down a little bit. Um, it's not a terrible movie. It's just a movie that shouldn't have won Best Picture, which I forgot to mention. Um, this list isn't, and this goes with part one as well. These rankings aren't necessarily like the most deserving because truth be told, a lot of these Best Picture winners, I don't think should have won Best Picture. So just throwing it out there just as, you know, a caveat, uh, I, which I should have mentioned, I guess, in part one and two, but whatever. Uh, but yeah, Drive Miss Daisy, it's, it is what it is. It's, it's entertaining for what it is. Um, so that's my number 60. Number 59 is Argo, which, uh, Ben Affleck did a decent job directing this. Um, it's thrilling to say the least. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a solid movie, I, I would say. So that's my number 59. Number 58 is Chariots of Fire, which has a great score by Vangelis. Besides that, and besides the opening scene of the, you know, them running on the beach, which is mostly memorable because of the score. Besides that, um, it's okay, I guess. Uh, so yeah, that's my number 58. Number 57 is My Fair Lady, which honestly, My Fair Lady is very similar to Gentleman's Agreement. And Gentleman's Agreement came out before, but I think with My Fair Lady, the reason why I like it much more is because Audrey Hepburn did such a great job. And it is a long film, but I don't know, it just... It has some really funny moments in it, and at the same time, it is really well shot, uh, which is, I think, why I like it a bit more than Gentleman's Agreement. But they are kind of similar when you, you know, actually process and think about it. So yeah, that's my number 57. Number 56 is Patton, which I really do need to rewatch this movie. It's very long, though, which is probably why I haven't revisited it anytime soon. But George C. Scott did a great job. The attention to detail is also really good. It's, you know, it's solid. That's why it's my number 56. Number 55 is The Lost Weekend, which honestly holds up very, very well today. I didn't love it, but I thought it was rock solid. I thought it was a pretty good depiction of alcoholism. Um, it's definitely a movie that was ahead of its time. And given the fact that I believe this came out while the code was still in, you know, check, kind of amazing, honestly, the fact that it came out the way that it did. But uh, yeah, so my number 55. Number 54 is Kramer versus Kramer. Uh, Dustin Hoffman and Meryl Streep, what can I say? They're really good. Um, I do like Marriage Story better, and the reason why I mentioned Marriage Story is, is because they're they're kind of similar. I do think that the acting Cream versus Kramer is what makes that movie memorable the way it is. Um, but Marriage Story, I, I do like a little bit better, which is probably why I'm mentioning it because you know when I think of Kramer versus Kramer, I think oh I can just watch Marriage Story, and I don't know if maybe it's because Marriage Story is still fresh in my mind versus Kramer versus Kramer. It's like you know I've had more and more time to process that. I don't know, but Kramer versus Kramer, I still respect. And, uh, yeah, that's why it's number 54. Next up, number 53, and this is going to be controversial, but my number 53 is Crash. Now, hear me out. I don't hate Crash. Is it preachy? Yes, especially towards the end. It is preachy, but it is well-made in terms of the filmmaking perspective. And I have to say that's one of the main reasons why I like the movie. Um, I won't say I love it, but I do, I do like it to an extent. I've seen this movie half a dozen times. Um, I think that... A lot of people hate on this movie and they say it's one of the worst Best Picture winners because, well, in my opinion, they haven't seen all 93 Best Picture winners. If people honestly think that this is the worst of the 93 Best Picture winners, I have to say it really does showcase how art is subjective uh, because, again, there are – heck, there's 40 other movies I thought were like lesser in terms of my ranking. So just saying – Crash, again, it is preachy. I'm not going to sit here and say it isn't, but I feel like more people hate it because it won Best Picture over Brokeback Mountain, but that's not Crash's fault. I love I love Brokeback Mountain. I own Brokeback Mountain. I do not own Crash any longer. Um, but again, that's more of a I wanted this to win versus, oh, the actual quality, you know, being like, you know, terrible versus actually being good. Um, so I, I think it's solid. I'm not going to sit here and say it's great. But I do think it's solid. And that's why when people, you know, have a backlash for this movie, I'm like, ah, whatever. Anyways, that's number 53. Number 52 is West Side Story, which the remake was supposed to come out in 2020. And the remake's actually coming out in 2021. And I'm going to be intrigued by that because 
I think West Side Story is definitely a time capsule of the 1960s. You know, that was a time period where there were a lot of, you know, musicals that were coming out. But West Side Story really does hold up pretty well, I would say. It's it's a little bit long, but it definitely holds my attention when I watched it. And I, I am looking forward to rewatching it in preparation for the remake. So yeah, that's my number 52. Number 51 is All the King's Men, which I have not seen the remake which stars Sean Penn, I believe, but the original All the King's Men is pretty darn good. I do like that movie, and I do need to rewatch that movie, but I, I did like that. And that's why it's my number 51. So 51 caps off part two, guys. Thank you very much for watching. Um, again, if this is your first time on the channel, I definitely want to hear your guys' uh, list for Academy Award Best Picture winners for all the ones that you've seen. Um, I'm going to be very intrigued to see if there are other people that have seen all 93 Best Picture winners because, truth be told, it's something that you know, I do see from time to time on Letterboxd people talking about trying to watch every single one. So I'm curious to hear who's seen every single one versus who's so close to seeing every single one. Because for me, again, it was like an eight-year journey. So I'm happy to, you know, be here amongst other film buffs and film critics to be able to say that I've seen them all. But anyways, guys, again, I want to hear your thoughts down below. And as always, stay tuned for part three, which will be number 50 to 26. And as always, don't forget the subscription, notification bell, and I'll catch you guys later.